بسم الله بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وله أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah, fantastic. So today, inshallah ta'ala, we're doing part two. Surah 85, Surah Al-Buruj. And today we're going to go more, we did last week the, or last class, we did the uh, introduction explaining uh, the story behind it that the Prophet ﷺ narrated. It's a lengthy hadith. This time, inshallah, we're going to get right into the introduction of the surah itself, inshallah. It is 22 verses long. It is a Mecki surah, we mentioned that. You could break it down in, in different ways. You could break it down as the, in five sections. The first talking about oaths and describing the sky. Uh, then after that part two is the companions of the ditch. And then in the center is describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that is talking about disbelieving past nations. And then fifthly, uh, the Quran is preserved in the sky. So that you can look at it from those uh, five perspectives. And they have a sort of ring structure to them in that the, the first is about the oath about the sky. The second one is how the Quran is preserved in the sky. And then the second and the fourth are also related in that uh, there's the companions of the ditch, uh, evil, evil people from the past, and then past nations like Fir'aun with Thamud, also past nations that were evil, and then the descriptions of Allah in the center. That's sort of the center of it all. Now this surah, so it's like a ring structure. This surah has a uh, zero commands. There's no, there's no uh, command, there's no uh, imperatives, amr, in the whole surah. It only has two questions. هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ الْجُنُودِ فِرْعَانُ وَثَمُودِ Two ayat, ayat 17 and 18 have uh, uh, questions in it. And then in terms of the times Allah Ta'ala has mentioned, many times. It's like I said, it's only 22 ayat long. And yet, subhanAllah, it seems that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala mentions uh, his, uh, his own name uh, in, in various ways. Many times, Allah Jalala, Allah Al-Aziz, Al-Hamid. Allah Ta'ala mentions himself as Shaheed, Rabbuka, your Lord. Uh, Allah talks about uh, he, he, he starts things and returns them he, uh, These are all descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He also refers to himself as, as, as Muhit So subhanAllah It seems that even though the surah itself is quite short Allah has talked about a lot And why is it the case? Well subhanAllah when, uh, The whole theme is persecution When you're being persecuted You want to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quite a bit You need to remember Allah ta'ala And all of his great names and attributes And how your reward is ultimately with him And how he is uh, taking care of your affairs And how you know Basically this is life is a test All this needs to come in mind So it seems very fitting This surah Yes that seems to be a, a very big theme of this surah That the believers will be tested Allah ta'ala mentions I believe it's at the beginning of surah uh, An-Kabut uh, uh, do, 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 the, do they believe uh, that they will? They can say that we believe and they will not be tested. This is a, a you know, Subhanallah. Allah Taala says that no, it's never going to be the case that you just say, oh yeah, I believe and Allah's not going to test that claim. That's the whole purpose of life. Life is one big test to figure out what you believe and if you're sincere about that. So this needs to be kept in mind. In fact, there's a funny quote. Uh, I don't know the authenticity of it. I found that it was. Uh, uh, attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib عنه, It was also attributed to Anas ibn Malik Different quotes of this nature And again, I'm not saying the authenticity But it's just a, it's an interesting quote لَوْ كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنَ فِي جُحِّ فَأْرَةٍ لَقَيَّضَ اللَّهُ لَهُ فِي مَنْ يُؤْذِيهِ Or another written narration or version of it is لَوْ خُلِقَ الْمُؤْمِنَ عَلَى رَأْسِ جَبَلٍ لَا بُدَّ لَهُ that the quotes are basically saying, if there was a believer even in, the, in a mouse hole, even in the, in the hole of a mouse, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would appoint somebody to go harm him and bother him. In other words, this life is a test. There's nowhere you're going to go. You could even be you know, in the most awkward, ridiculous place. SubhanAllah, somehow something is going to come and bother you. Another, and the other version is saying that... that uh, any believer who is even on the top of a mountain, there, there's no doubt that a hypocrite or another narration says a, 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 a shaitan, either a, hip, a munafiq or a shaitan is going to come to harm him so that he will be rewarded by it. So, uh, uh, so that he will be uh, rewarded because of that. So subhanAllah, it seems that this is the way the world is. doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what's happening. There's going to be tests that come your way. There's going to be people that test you and test your patience and so forth. And so in hard times like that, it's important to look to your role models and part of your role models, especially in this, in this particular surah, are those who held on to their faith even in the worst of circumstances, even when they were being told you're going to be entered into the fire. SubhanAllah, they still held on. Khair inshallah. So, what's fascinating is that since this surah is about uh, persecution, 
One interesting fact is that when people are being persecuted or when you see injustice in the world, I mean, subhanAllah, even now today, people are often asking the questions, you know, uh, uh, you know look at um, the Uyghur or uh, Uyghur, I don't know how you pronounce it correctly, uh, in, in, in China, how the Muslims are being persecuted over there. Right, look at what's happening in Kashmir, in India, uh, let's say, uh, what's happening to the Muslims in India, let's say what's happening in Palestine, let's say what's happening Af in Afghanistan. In fact, I was speaking to an Afghani brother recently, he was like, why does everybody make du'a for every country except for Afghanistan? <laughs> he was like, it seems, seems that it's normal to make du'a for all these countries, but Afghanistan, and I said, well, brother, you know, we're living in America, and so, with every, you know, maybe that's part of the, uh, but that's, that could be the reason that we feel that, oh no, are we going to be considered enemies if we make du'a? So anyway, uh, it's just a reality that, uh, subhanAllah, I mean, how many, subhanAllah, uh, whether it be making du'a for Somalia, make, but making du'a for all these different countries, you know, many a time people ask deep questions. They ask, where, it, where are the angels in all this? They ask the questions, where's the justice in all this? They ask, isn't anybody watching this? Doesn't anybody care? Isn't Allah all-powerful? Why aren't these people being punished? Where's Allah's punishment in all this? Why isn't Allah angry at them in all this? Where's our reward? Doesn't Allah care? Isn't Allah loving? Isn't, doesn't Allah care about us? And can't Allah Ta'ala do something about this? These are, seem to be the type of questions. And what's fascinating is that this surah is about an atrocity and all these questions are answered. Where are the angels? al buruj. Allah mentions where the angels are. They're in, this, they're in the heavens in these great fortresses. Buruj, we're going to talk about it in a second, but it has two meanings. Uh, one of them is in the constellations. Another one is a, a, a Buruj or Burj is a, uh, a fortress or a castle. And basically the heavens is where these great uh, amounts and numbers of a angels are that are like in these fortresses ready to attack and ready to fight and aid the believers. Where's the justice? Waliyawm uh, al The day that is appointed, ju judgment day. People are asking, where's the justice? Well, Allah is telling you when justice comes. Justice comes on judgment day. Or, إِنَّهُ هُوَ يُبَدِئُ وَيُعِيدُ He is the one who starts things, creates, creates things, and he brings them back. That's another allusion and another mention of judgment day. And so Allah is saying, when is the justice going to come? On judgment day. Isn't anybody watching? وَالشَّاهِدِ mashhud. Yes, there are witnesses. And yes, people are, uh, what, what is happening is being witnessed. And furthermore, Allah Ta'ala also mentions, Allah is a witness over everything. The question, isn't Allah all-powerful? Allah Ta'ala says what? He has the, 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 all, the, all the dominion and the power over, over the heavens and the earth. Furthermore, Allah Ta'ala mentions what? Allah says what? Allah Ta'ala can do whatever He wants. Isn't Allah powerful? Yes, Allah is powerful. So where is Allah's punishment? Allah Ta'ala mentions where is his punishment. That the disbelievers who did this fitna on the believers, what do they get? They get this, uh, extreme, this, this punishment of the fire. They get, they get uh, punished in Jahannam, in hellfire. Where is Allah's anger? Indeed, the, uh, the, the, the anger and the rage of your Lord is severe and intense. That yes, when Allah Ta'ala sees this, uh, these atrocities and these horrible events, yes, Allah Ta'ala is extremely angry at this. Some people ask the question, where is our reward? Allah Ta'ala mentions what? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ جَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرِ The believers are, are those who are in, uh, uh, for them, for those who believe and do good deeds, they have jannat gardens, which under, underneath which rivers flow. And that is the greatest of attainments. Doesn't Allah care? Allah Ta'ala says what? Uh, uh, he is the all-forgiving and He is al-wadud. He is the uh, uh, compassionate and, and the most loving. So the question like, why is it, doesn't Allah care? The answer is yes, absolutely Allah cares. Can't Allah do something about this? Yes, Allah Ta'ala says what? Haven't you seen Hal Ataka Hadithul Junud Fir'an wa Thamud Bali Ladina Kafarufi Takdib Wallahum Waraihim Muhit? Haven't you seen the past nations, how they were destroyed? Haven't you seen how Allah Ta'ala has encompassed them? How they're in denial of what's going to happen? SubhanAllah, so all this is answering. So, this, so it just goes to show that this surah, which is about an atrocity, is really a surah to look to when we are thinking about the various atrocities that are taking place uh, in this earth, even uh, right now. It's also interesting and fascinating that this surah is unique in that the whole surah revolves around this one story of Ashab al-Ukhdud, and this only seems to happen one other time in the Qur'an. And that is in Surah Yusuf. That Surah Yusuf from beginning to end is all about Yusuf alayhi salam in one single story. So it seems quite interesting from that perspective. And another thing that's also fascinating is the ring structure. I know I mentioned a broad ring structure when you break it down into five parts. But there's another way to break it down into, I believe, 
uh, 11 parts. And we, like, so, so ayah number one and ayat uh, 21 and 22 talk about the sky, right? Sama'i dhat al buruj, and then, uh, uh, you know, that the Quran is filo hil mahfuz, it's in the uh, preserve. And both of them are talking about forts because buruj means uh, uh, the constellation, but it also means. Fort, fortresses, and that this lawh al mahfuz it's protecting. So not only things in the sky, but things that are in the sky that are specifically protecting, which is a very interesting parallel between the first, the beginning, and the ending. Then when you go to ayat 2 and 3, Allah is talking about judgment day and the witness versus the witnessed. And furthermore, Allah in ayah number 20, so if you go closer than that, Allah is talking about how he is all-encompassing, how he's witnessing everything. So you see a, a clear parallel there. Then after that, from ayat uh, 4 to 7, it talks about ashabul ukhdud, the companions of the ditch, these, these criminals. And then 17 to 19, talk about Fir'aun, Thamud, and all these past nations that did other crimes. So there's a clear correlation there. From ayat 8 to 9, there are descriptions about Allah, and ayat 13 to 16, descriptions about Allah as well. From ayat 10 and ayat 12, so again, uh, these, these two getting closer to the center, talks about the punishment for disbelievers and then Allah's anger. And then finally, in the exact middle, is ayah number 11, which mentions what? The center verse, which is the reward for the believers. And so I know that it's really hard to imagine all this, and I don't know if the camera could pick it up, but basically I try to, I try to color code these things. <laughs> so I try to color code them. Pretty good, pretty good shot. Anyway, I try to color code these things because when you see it in different colors, Alhamdulillah, you can try this, you can write down what I said at home and then put the different colors and see how they all correlate. And it's just truly remarkable. And it's not like, you know, it's a side point, but you know, those who claim that, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu he just made this up and you know, these are just words from himself. If theoretically, this was somebody who was just making this up and was putting these amazing patterns of ring structures and so forth in the Quran, don't you think he would have given a hint about it or just mentioned that, like, by the way, not only is the content amazing and not only is it stylistically incredible and not only are the uh, beliefs and ideas and arguments, you know, fascinating, but just, did you notice that it also has a ring structure? No, not a single mention. Only generations later, many generations later, people are reading and memorizing, learning, they say, hey, you know what? It seems that there's a ring structure going on in this Quran. Subhanallah. So did he get lucky? Did he just not talk about it and not brag about it and just let himself die and say, no, no, it's okay that, you know, uh, one day they'll find out later. Why? So, so even known about ring I mean, a lot of them. So that's exactly the point, right? So, I mean, even the idea, like, who thinks like that, right? Who thinks to even do something like this? Like, oh, I'll add one extra element that's just really fascinating that the beginning and the, will match with the end and then the second and the second to last and the third and the third to last and all the way till the center idea is, 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 is manifest. And this happens over and over again throughout the Qur'an. So subhanAllah, I hope we can take a second to just be blown away by this, this, this fact. Khair inshallah. Next. I'm doing this wrong. There you go. So we begin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wasamai that al buruj. By the sky, what means by it's swearing an oath. As sama by the sky. That al buruj. That possesses and that contains buruj. As we mentioned, the word uh, uh, the verb baraja or barija yabruju means to elevate something, to be apparent, and to be enlarged. These are all different meanings of this verb. Why? Because a fortress is something elevated, it's something high, it's something that is very obvious and on display, and it's something that's very large. And so, and also, same thing with the, uh, the uh, um, uh, heavens and like the constellations. It's something that you look up to, something that's very big, very beautiful, very bright, and so forth. So yes, this word uh, uh, barj, burj, or buruj, that's the plural. The, the, the first two were singular. The last was th the plural. This means a tower, a fort, or a cluster of stars like a constellation. And by the way, it's important to recognize that this does not mean the zodiac signs. I know that uh, the famous translation of Abdul Yusuf Ali, may Allah have mercy on him, and may Allah bless him, he did a great job, but obviously there are, he's a human being, there's certain mistakes, and that, that's how the eye is translated by the zodiac signs, and the zodiac signs are, it's a concept that is very much associated with various beliefs and ideas and so forth, that's not what it's referring to. It's referring to the constellations, that's something, it's just a fact, there are certain clusters of stars in the sky that are e easily recognizable, but attributing, attributing different uh, you know, animals to them or different beliefs to them, that's a whole different thing. So I hope that's clear. Um, yes. Why does Allah Ta'ala call something to oath? Uh, call, uh, 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 why does Allah swear an oath by things? Because what he's going to swear, or what he's going to mention, swear about, is going to be proven or is going to somehow be affected by what was sworn to. I know that's a little bit abstract, but the obvious example that I almost always give is وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ فِي خُسْرِ That by time, man is in loss. Why would you swear by time that man is in loss? You could say number one, because this is the case in all times and in all places, right? It's throughout all the ages. 
That's one reason. Also, so that's why you swear by time. And another reason is because what, is, what are people constantly losing? Time. So Allah swears by time that you're constantly losing. Losing what? You're losing time. That's why you swear by because there's a correlation. How are we all losing time? You can't stop the clock. Every second that goes by, your life is getting shorter and shorter and you're getting closer to your inevitable death. And so that's something that we're all losing and there's nothing you could do about it. We're all losing time. So in this particular case, I'm gonna, when I, once I mention all the oaths, I'm going to show how it correlates to uh, the main theme, inshallah ta'ala. So we just have to be patient. But also when Allah swears by something, it's talking about what, how great His creation is. And Allah is talking about how great these, the, you know, the heavens are, the stars are, something to be amazed by. And also it's, it's, it's the fact that these are fortresses, these constellations are fortresses for who? For the angels. And these angels are, are, angels are ready to support the believers and they are waiting to come down in rows as Allah mentions in uh, uh, Surah, Surah Al-Fajr that they're ready to come down in rows for Judgment Day. So this is all an allusion to the fact that these angels are ready to come and establish Allah's uh, justice. And so never, be, never think that you're not being watched from, from the heavens above, from the angels above you and from Allah Ta'ala above, uh, uh, above as well. And so that's one point, and that's even further uh, emphasized by the fact with shahidin wa mashhud, that you're being witnessed. So yes, this is a reference to al mala al a'la, the highest of co co companies. And another reason is because these angels in the highest company, al mala al a'la, they are guards and they limit the jinn from taking knowledge from their conversations and by pelting them with meteors. And this is something that is known uh, from Surah Al-Jinn. Allah talks about uh, Shihab al-Rasada, how they get pelted with these different meteors. And so uh, whether it is the jinn that try to cross their boundaries or whether it be different great nations of the past like Ashab al-Ukhdud that try to cross their boundaries by burning people alive or whether it be you Quraysh because this was revealed in Mecca. So the Quraysh were the primary audience. So whether it be you, Quraysh, who are trying to cross your boundaries with the Prophet and with the Sahaba, just know this, anybody who crosses Allah's limits will not go unnoticed. Anybody who tries to cross Allah Ta'ala's limits, it will never go unnoticed. Allah Ta'ala will hold you to account. This verb, tabarraj, uh, uh, tabarraja, uh, comes shows up in the Qur'an a few times. Uh, it comes up mentioning in surah, uh, uh, both uh, Surah An-Nur and Surah um, Ahzab, well, referring to, because tabarraj, tabarraja means to show and display one's beauty. And in one ayah, ayah Allah Ta'ala is talking about how after a certain age, you do not have to cover yourself up because you're not of that age where you're displaying your beauty. That's in Surah uh, Nur. And Allah ta talks about how when younger women, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, they should cover up their beauty and not do tabarrujul jahiliyyah. They should not display, display their beauty like the display of ignorance, of jahiliyyah. And in terms of buruj, this word shows up three times in reference to the constellations and once it talks about forts when Allah t says wherever you are death will overtake you even if you should be within a big lofty tower that you will be taken even if you are in these buruj you, Allah is still going to take your life so that you'll never escape death so that's what sama'i that al buruj wal yawm al maw'ud and the day that is promised the promised day notice that there's an al here so this is talking about the well known promised day so that makes it pretty clear that it's talking about Judgment Day, Allah Ta'ala knows best. And by the way, this word maw'ud only shows up one time in the Qur'an. So it's a, it makes it a unique ayah, this promised day. And then Allah says, wa shahidin wa mashhud. These are the three oaths at the beginning. Wa means and, a shahid means the, the witness, and mashhud means that which is witnessed, the thing that is being witnessed. Now this has something like 24 different interpretations because it's left open-ended, it's nakira. It's not as shahid al-mashhud, it's wa uh, shahidin wa mashhudin, and the in at the end means that it's nakira. That, so it's 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 uh, uh, indefinite. It's open ended, by a witness and that which is witnessed. What could this be referring to? This could be referring to the witness being uh, uh, the people who did the evil act. And their act being witnessed by Allah Ta'ala, by the angels and so forth. So, and there's, and the, the humanity could be the witness and that which is going to be witnessed could be judgment day. That's another interpretation. Creation is witnessing and that which is witnessed is la ilaha illallah. So all of the creation is testifying to the fact of the oneness of Allah, of Tawheed. And that which is witnessed could be Tawheed itself. Humanity are the witnesses and the past nations are, that have been ruined are, is that which is being witnessed. That's what's going to be mentioned in the surah later on. Uh, furthermore, Allah Ta'ala could be the shahid, the witness of everything, and all the creation is the mashhud, is everything that is witnessed. 
It could be the angels that are writing down the deeds and the deeds themselves, that is what is witnessed. So like I said, there's so many ways to interpret this. And, but I think that based on the previous context, that humanity is, uh, 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 is um, that which is being witnessed and that the angels are the one witnessing and they're re- recording them, uh, the, their deeds. I think this is, uh, well, Adam seems to be the strongest or one of the strongest because Allah says, وَجَاءَتْ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَعَهَا سَائِقٌ وَشَهِيدٌ And every soul will come with its driver and with a witness, as in these are the angels that take witness of what has taken place. So Allah Adam, this seems to be the case. Now, obviously, there, there's also a hadith about this. The Prophet ﷺ did give us uh, the interpretation, which is, I, you could say, the, the, the most uh, authoritative, obviously. But, you know, there, there's tawassur fi al-ma'na. There's different, I mean, even though the Prophet ﷺ has his commentary about this, that doesn't mean that there can't be multiple interpretations. So the Prophet ﷺ gave uh, the, you could say, the strongest and the most absolute interpretation when he said, al-yawm al-maud, yawm al-qiyamah. That uh, the promised day is judgment day, obviously. Wa yawm al-mashhud is yawm al-arafah. Yom Arafah, that the witness day is the day of Arafah, because perhaps, Wallah Alam, that's the day where the most people are present, and therefore the most people are there to witness one another. So that is the witness day. And a shahid, uh, the, the, the witnesser, is Yom al Jum'ah, the day of Friday. This, uh, why? Because the day of Friday is a witness to those who do good deeds, to those who come to Jum'ah, to those who gain the message. And subhanAllah, the Prophet goes on to say, وَمَا طَلَعَتِ الشَّمْسِ وَلَا غَرَبَتْ عَلَى يَوْمٍ أَفْضَلْ مِنْهُ There's no single day that the sun rises upon or sets upon that is better than the day of Jum'ah. فِيهِ سَاعَةٌ لَا يُوَافِقُهَا عَبْدٌ مُؤْمِنٌ يَدْعُ اللَّهَ بِخَيْرٍ إِلَّا إِسْتَجَابَ اللَّهِ that there's, There is an hour in it, there's a time in it where if you make a dua in that time, then, inshallah ta'ala, uh, 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 Allah ta'ala will respond to that dua. And anybody who seeks refuge and help from Allah, Allah will respond and give that person help. So this is the hadith in, it's a Hassan hadith in Tirmidhi. Now, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَعْعُودِ وَالشَّاهِدِ الْمَشْهُودِ Allah is swearing by these constellations above you, these fortresses that contain angels. Allah is swearing by, judge, uh, by the promised day, judgment day. And Allah is swearing by that which is wi- the witnesser and that which is being witnessed. And then Allah says what? قُتِلَ أَصْحَابُ الْأُخْدُودِ Cursed and destroyed are the companions of the fire. Uh, the companions, excuse me, the, the companions of the ditch, excuse me. Here's the question. What is the correlation between the three oaths? And it's called the muqsam bihi. And then, then what Allah is swearing by? And muqsam alayhi, the thing that Allah is swearing by. What is the correlation between these things? Two opinions. One opinion is that there is no correlation that the muqsam alayh is actually mahdhuf, that the thing that Allah is swearing to is actually omitted. So it's as if Allah is saying, I'm swearing by the angels above that are watching, I'm swearing by judgment day in which they're going to grab your souls and bring you and present you and show your deeds, and I'm swearing by the fact that they are witnesses and they're witnessing what you're, witness, uh, what you're doing. I'm swearing by all that. What? And Allah doesn't mention it, it's just understood. I'm swearing that judgment day is a reality, is a fact, and it cannot be avoided. And then Allah begins the story of Ashab al ukhdud That's one interpretation. That is mahdhuf. It is uh, omitted. Now, this does have a precedent. In Surah Qaf, Allah mentions Qaf wal Quran al Majid. Qaf by this honorable and noble Quran. Bal ajibu. But rather, they wonder and ja'ahum mundirun that, that, that a warner has come to them. So, why would Allah say, I swear, Qaf, I'm swearing by this noble, honorable Quran? And then Allah says, So, what's the, what are you swearing by? What are you swearing to? Then Allah says, Rather, they can't believe that a warner came to them. So it seems that the muqsam alay, the thing that Allah is swearing by, is understood. It is not mentioned because Allah changes subjects before getting to it. So inshallah, when we get to Surah Qaf, we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more. But all I'm trying to say is that this, this is not unprecedented. However, it seems that the most, this, uh, if you want the sort of safest opinion, is that no, we don't assume any, anything that's mahdhuf. We don't ex- uh, 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 understand that anything is omitted. Rather, what we say instead is what? That Allah is using these three oaths to, sw- to make an oath about this atrocity. But then the question is, what's the correlation? What's the correlation between these three oaths about the angels above and the, 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 the stars above you and the judgment day and about the, that which is witnessed, uh, the witness and that which is witnessed? What does that have to do with Ashab al Uqdud? So Allah Alam, I think this, there's one interpretation that is very deep and very powerful. And what is that? That oftentimes in an atrocity, when we witness an atrocity, and again, we mention the different atrocities that are taking place today. What are the things that people say? Why is this happening? How is this happening? This is too wrong. This is evil. I can't believe. And people become disheartened. People lose faith. People lose hope. People get very depressed. 
And this, it becomes so encompassing or, or so uh, 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 engulfing that they can't even think about anything else. Sometimes it's just overwhelming that when, so, when atrocity happens, when lots of deaths take place and something bad's happening, you can't think of anything else. It's just so overwhelming. So Allah Ta'ala is saying, look, number one, don't forget to look where? Above. Don't just think that this whole dunya is everything. When an atrocity is happening on the dunya, don't forget that this earth is a little speck. Look up at the heavens. Look at how huge and vast this universe is. And immediately you start to realize that, well, we're just like a bunch of tiny little nothings on this little ball and we're just hurting each other and doing bad things to each other. But ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, this universe is so big. There's the galaxies upon galaxies. It's so big out there. So I'm so concerned, and, and as we should be, but I, I feel like the whole world is evil and the whole universe is evil. Why? Because something bad took place in front of my eyes and that's the only thing I can see. But subhanAllah, take a second to stop and realize there's a whole universe out there that has nothing to do with this planet, right? That is just vastness of space. Don't think that this is everything. So even if this is a huge atrocity, just remember that this planet itself is not huge. And, you know, everything on it is not huge. So that's number one. Don't forget to look above. Number two, don't forget to look forward. Yes, this atrocity is taking place now. But don't forget to look above and don't forget to look forward. Forward in the future, what? Judgment day is going to take place. And when you look forward and you realize that, look, after maybe a few weeks, a few months, a few years, this atrocity is going to sub subside, this is going to go away, and inshallah ta'ala, life will go on. And then eventually, every, all judgment will take place, and everybody will get what's coming to them. So don't forget to look above, don't forget to look forward, and also don't forget to look deeper. Shahidin wa mashhud, by the witness, and that which they are witnessing. What is the idea here? Don't forget to look deeper. You see people doing all sorts of evil. How could they be doing this? These soldiers are killing these people. They're uh, committing all sorts of atrocities to those people. And you just see the actions. But don't forget that these actions are being witnessed by who? Allah Ta'ala is witnessing this. The angels are witnessing this. History is going to witness to the fact of what they've done. They might be thinking to themselves that, oh, I'm just doing this and I'm getting away with it. But it could be that they're going to be put on trial tomorrow. It could be that maybe they'll pass away, but later generations will judge them and know what they did was awful. So the truth is on your side and, and the history will be recorded and will, will testify to what took place here today. And lastly, and lastly, and one of the most perhaps interesting, is that they are witnessing themselves. Don't think that when a criminal does something evil, that just because they got away with it, that their subconscious is not going to eat away at them. We all know, what, what is it called? P PTSD, right? Post-traumatic stress disorder. That people come back from a war, they've done all sorts of atrocities. They've seen all sorts of oppression. They've killed people. They've hurt people. And then they've come home and everybody's thinking, oh, they got away with it. They're thinking, hey, I got away with it. And then what? They can't sleep at night. They, give, they become addicted to all sorts of addictions, right? They become, they, their lives get completely ruined and destroyed. And they're doing it to themselves. Why? Because they witnessed what they did. So don't, and, and the rest of humanity witnessed it. They witnessed it themselves. Allah witnessed it. And everything will come to pass on Judgment Day. So all of these things are put together that when an atrocity takes place, don't forget to look above, don't forget to look forward, and don't forget to look deeper that ultimately all this is being witnessed and uh, is being recognized. So I hope that's clear. Another interesting point. Qutila ashab. Yes. That uh, sahib means to be around something all the time. It's not because they were around the ditch all the time, but because this one insta instance or incident in their life was something that they will be known by for the rest of their lives. So it was a very significant moment in their lives. So that's why they will be considered ashab al ukhdud. You know, that's, that, they will be always associated forever with this incident because of how terrible it was. So that's why they're called ashab al ukhdud. And what's also interesting is that qutila is mentioned five times in the Qur'an. The word qutila shows up five times. Once, it shows up in, in the same context, like back to back, two ayat right next to each other. So, so we'll say four different uh, uh, contexts, okay? The word qutila shows up in four different contexts. What are they? Surah Dhariyat, Allah mentions what? Qutila uh, al Cursed are those who invent lies. In Surah Mudathir, qutila kayfa qaddar, thumma qutila kayfa qaddar. How cursed is the way he was contemplating and going back and forth and trying to make up some sort of a lie. He was trying to concoct, this is talking about uh, uh, Walid ibn Mughira, Al Walid ibn al Mughira. He was trying to make up lies against the Prophet. And, and therefore, Allah is saying, cursed is the way he was thinking and calculating of how to make up a lie. Number three is Qutilat insanu ma akfara, cursed in Surah uh, Abasa. Cursed is a human being, uh, how he denies the truth. And then number, five, uh, number, uh, number four is this one, Qutila uh, uh, Ashab al Ukhdud. Cursed are the companions of the ditch. Now, why do I mention these four? Because when you look at these four, it's so beautiful how they have a consistency within them. Number one, you're cursed when you invent 
something that's false. You invent a lie. You invent some sort of, uh, uh, you know, some sort of a false belief or religion or idea. Then, after inventing the lie, you start coming up with inventions as to how to defend that lie. That was number two. And then number three, when the truth comes to you to oppose it, you openly deny that truth, even though you know it's right. You just deny it anyway. That was number three. And then number four, when you, can no lo- when you feel defeated, like, look, I can't invent any other uh, lies. I can't justify them anymore. And the truth is so overwhelming. How can I keep resisting? You just kill the guy who's coming with the truth. And that's exactly what we're dealing with in this surah. So isn't that amazing that you see a consistency between all four words of qutila? Or uh, there's five instances, but four, four uh, contexts. Four contexts of this word qutila. That subhanAllah, it shows up these, uh, uh, these, uh, in these four different contexts and it's like it's building on each other. You make something up, you invent a lie. Then you have to justify it. So you kind of try to figure out a way to make it sound reasonable. Then the truth comes and completely destroys you, so you just deny the truth, even though you know it's true. And then you feel so overwhelmed that you say, let's, let's attack this guy. Let's break this guy down. Let's even kill him so he never does it again. SubhanAllah, this is how, this is how the most accursed people uh, go in their progression. SubhanAllah, may Allah protect us. Now, Qutila Ashabul Ukhdud, cursed are the people of the ditch. Uh, now, this could be of, this is obviously talking about the, the, the incident that I mentioned about Yemen, the Prophet went into detail about it, the boy and the king. But this could refer to any incident in which people do mass uh, genocides and atrocities where they kill a bunch of people and then throw them in ditches afterwards. Uh, and so this ta- has taken place many times in history. It will probably continue to happen many times in history. And so this surah is uh, something that we need to keep in mind whenever we deal with these type of instances. Ukhdud means a ditch. The plural is akhadid or khudad, which means trenches, grooves, or excavations. And uh, uh, it also this, this root letter, uh, this root letters of kha, uh, dal, dal also show up one other time to mention khad, a cheek, in the Quran, surah, in surah Luqman. And what's interesting is that the correlation is because a cheek can have grooves in it when you wrinkle. That's why the root, the verb takhaddada means to wrinkle. And uh, uh, so yeah, when you smile, or when you get older and your face starts to wrinkle, it starts to, de- to develop grooves in it. And so there's the correlation between the two words. I thought that was quite interesting. By the way, the fact that Allah Ta'ala is saying cursed is the person, cursed is the one who uh, 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 basically burned the believers and tried to force them out of their religion, this is further evidence that we don't believe in enforced religion. We don't believe that you can force somebody into faith. That's why we believe Allah Ta'ala says what? La ikraha fid din. Allah says there is no compulsion in religion. Allah says also what? وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَآمَنَا مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ كُلُّهُمْ جَمِيعًا If we wished, we could have made everybody a believer. أَفَأَنْتَ تُكْرِهُ النَّاسِ حَتَّى يَكُونُ مُؤْمِنِينَ So will you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, force people to be believers then? Uh, and so the answer is obviously no, you cannot force all of mankind because if Allah wanted, He would have forced all of mankind. He would have made them all believers. So you do not have a right to do so. So in other words, we can't force people to believe. And so all this about, you know, uh, oh, you know, Muslims have uh, Islam spread by the sword, all this, it's just not true. And nari dhatil waqood. Then Allah Ta'ala mentions, what? The fire, dhatil waqood. That means possessing. Nar means fire. That means possessing. Waqood means uh, uh, fuel. So what does this imply? It's possible that a person is holding a certain false belief that they hold dear in their heart. And then somebody comes to them and proves them wrong. And out of the heat of the moment, because they became very defensive and they felt like their character was being attacked, and because they were so embarrassed, they attacked the guy and hit the guy. Now, obviously that's terrible. You should accept the truth, even if you feel overwhelmed by it, even if it shocks you or whatever the case is, you should accept the truth in all, in all circumstances. However, it seems that sometimes it's possible that out of emotion, you react and reject, reject the truth and do something bad. But subhanAllah, how much worse is it if not only do you reject the truth and it wasn't out of an emotional reaction, but rather you had the time to think about what was said. You had the time to say, wow, this person proved me wrong. Wow, this person was right and I'm completely wrong. So you know what I'll do? I'm going to take the time to dig a trench. I'm going to get lots of fuel. I'm going to light up this gigantic fire and I'm going to push them in it one by one. Not out of emotion, not out of the heat of the moment, no pun intended, not out of that in any way but rather purely uh, as a calculated move. So subhanAllah, in such a circumstance, such a person deserves, and this uh, another thing, uh, another interpretation, uh, I mean, as Ahsan Islahi, he says that these are all ayat referring to people who persecute the believers. This is going to be their punishment. An-nari dhat al They're going to go into a fire that is very well fueled. And this is similar to when Allah says what? Naru Allah al Allah's fire is uh, uh, very well, uh, is, is perpetually fueled and never burns out. Then Allah says what? 
إِذْ هُمْ عَلَيْهَا قُعُودٌ إِذْ when هُمْ عَلَيْهَا قُعُودٌ When they were upon it, when they were at this, the edge of this fire, قُعُود And this is not just uh, julus. Julus would mean just sitting there, but قُعُود means sitting there for a long time. In other words, what? They were really getting a kick out of it. You know, sometimes when people become so rotten, after killing so many people, they become good at it, they become comfortable with it, they start to find it entertaining. So they sit there out of the joy of watching people die and watching people, hey, look at that guy, he rolled around in a funny way. Oh, look how that person burned, that was unique, that was interesting. They become, their heart becomes so calloused and so hard that they actually enjoy watching people uh, die. You know, and so subhanAllah, this goes to, uh, this, is, this is referring to this type of person who is so wretched that they were actually just sitting there and enjoying uh, this type of torture. وَهُمْ عَلَىٰ And the final ayah that we're, co- we're going to cover today, inshaAllah. وَهُمْ عَلَىٰ مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ شُهُودِ And they were, these people specifically were, عَلَىٰ مَا يَفْعَلُونَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ Over what they were doing to the believers, shuhud. They were witnessing. So they knew exactly what they were doing. They were uh, witnesses, they are going to be witnessing against themselves. And another way of interpreting this ayah is that Allah is, is referring to this is going to be their punishment in Judgment Day. Because they persecuted the believers, they will be sat at the edge of the hellfire on Judgment Day, and they will be shown all the different things that they, uh, they will be shown all the things that they did to the believers. This is how you persecuted them, this is how you hurt them, this is how you insulted them, this is how you lied against them, this is how you created rumors against them. Everything they'll be shown, and that's going to add to the psychological torture before the physical torture, before they're pushed into the fire. So that's one interpretation. But yes, the other interpretation is that Allah is saying, the, the most straightforward interpretation, Allah is saying what? This is what you people did. You yaf'alun. Allah doesn't say amila, ya'malun. Allah says, يفعلون, that you did this with ease. This was natural to you. You people were so hard-hearted and so vile that comfortably and naturally you would uh, 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 witnessed, you were witnessing what? What you were doing to the believers, pushing them into the fire. And Allah advances al-mu'mineen, puts them first before mentioning uh, 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 the disbelievers being shuhud. Why? To mention that these, they have a, 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 a fadl or you could say that they, have, uh, they, they deserve to be mentioned first because they are better. And so, subhanAllah, we all know that the decent person is the one who reacts to uh, injustice. When you see an injustice happening, ف, uh, what's, the, what's the hadith? مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ فَيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ وَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتِعْ فَبِقَلْبِهِ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ الْإِمَانِ The Prophet says what? Famous hadith that whoever sees an evil, let him change it with his hand. If he can't do that, then let him change it with his tongue. And if he can't do that, let him hate it in his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. And so these people. Forget about changing the evil. They were perpetuating it and they were sitting so comfortably enjoying it and witnesses to it. So it just goes to show how vile they were. And so the last point that I'll mention is that when it comes to fitan, when it comes to atrocities, there are four different reactions. One is to avoid them, just get away, run away, and just stay away from the the evil. Number two is to remain in the area and to try to be patient with it and hopefully have some sort of a positive effect on it if you can. Uh, uh, in, in a society that's going through some sort of fitna and turmoil. Number three is to uh, have a reactionary uh, 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 desire to change it, like an evil happens and you immediately get kicked into gear and you want to stop it. And the fourth one is to actually plan it out, which is the best one, to plan out how you're going to stop this evil from taking place. And all four of these are mentioned in the four stories of Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf, we talk about the uh, Ashab Al-Kahf, the companions of the cave, what do they do? They just got out. They went to the cave and escaped. I'tizal, just just uh, uh, you know, uh, um, detaching oneself and uh, uh, um, isolating oneself from the evil of the society. Number two was Sahibul Jannatain, the guy, who, the, the 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 companion of the two car- gardens. You know, the, the two that were arguing in the garden uh, about the garden. This guy, he was still being friends with this guy who was rude and being a disbeliever and, and being disrespectful, he was still his friend and even taking the abuse. The guy was saying, oh, you know, he was insulting him essentially, saying, you know, oh, how's your terrible business going and how, you know, your small band of workers and so forth. Me, my business is doing great. So he's belittling him. And so he took this patiently and tried to give advice and say, look, you shouldn't, you shouldn't insult me. You don't, you don't know. Maybe Allah's going to take away your blessings and give me blessings instead. So he was remaining within the society. Number three is the reaction, trying to change it quickly. And this is referring to Musa alayhi salam. We know that Musa alayhi salam had this quality where when he saw injustice happening with the soldier, punch the soldier, kill him. Even though he was too much, he didn't want to do, he acted so, so hastily that subhanAllah he killed him even though he didn't want to. When he saw the women 
were not able to get water to their animals, he jumped into action even though he was completely uh, feeling weak and broken and, and, and had no energy, he still found the energy to jump into action. So Musa a.s. had this quality of always jumping into action and then the whole story of Surah Al-Kahf, him and Khidr, is to show don't be so quick to jump into action. Even if you see uh, uh, you know, property being destroyed, see the wisdom behind it. But even if you see death happening, don't just jump into action. Try to think first and see what's happening behind it. Be patient and just learn from the situation. Even if you see that people are doing work and making so much effort to do good and it's getting unrewarded, don't just jump into action immediately. And don't, don't be reactionary. Try to see the wisdom and Allah's wisdom behind all of it. And then the fourth one is Dhul Qarnayn. And he's the one who had a, a, a big plan to uh, fix uh, Ya'juj and Ma'juj and the problem and so forth. And he didn't just j jump into a reactionary attitude. Rather, he planned out a very intelligent way to get himself and the people who were being uh, afflicted by, this, the, by, this, uh, by the, this evil. He found a way for them to uh, uh, fix the problem. So those are the four different ways of dealing with a, a, a fitna. And so you could say, well, uh, that this falls into the uh, second category, just bearing it patiently. And that's exactly what these people did. They uh, 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 remained patient and believed in Allah. And for that, they died and they get, were given the greatest of victories. And so, which is called shahada. Allahumma ja'ala min shahada May Allah make us of those who are, who attain shahada. Amin ya rabbil alameen. And so with that, we close. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll continue next week. Bi'idhnillah. May Allah Ta'ala make us of those who learn this Qur'an, understand this Qur'an, teach this Qur'an, live by this Qur'an, and ultimately die by this Qur'an, uh, Qur'an by the, Allah's word. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.